Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Dirks, and on behalf of ACRL and Choice, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Librarians as Stakeholders in Managing the Research Enterprise, which is sponsored by Elsevier. Today's discussion is one in a series of sponsored webinars from ACRL and Choice that addresses new ideas, developments, and products of interest to the academic library community. Free to users, these structured 60-minute live presentations provide the opportunity for interactive discussions of important new issues and developments in academic librarianship by librarians, vendors, authors, and other interested stakeholders. Before we get started, I'd like to point out a few features of the webinar software. In the main area of the screen, you can follow along with the presentation materials. Along the right-hand side, you'll see a Q&A panel and a chat panel. If you don't, you can click the buttons labeled Chat and Q&A in the upper right corner of the screen to activate the panels. Please use the Q&A panel to submit questions to our speakers. At the end of the presentation, they will take a few minutes to answer your questions, so please do send them in throughout. If you experience any technical issues, please use the chat panel to let me know, and I'll troubleshoot the issue with you privately. Today, we're using the hashtag ACRL Choice Webinars during and after this event, so if you have another screen handy, shout out to us. We're at choice underscore reviews on Twitter. Also note that we are recording today's program, and everyone who registered today will receive a follow-up email with a link to the archived version. All right, and here to introduce our speakers today is Taylor Stang from Elsevier. Taylor, over to you. Great. Thank you, Mark. Uh, and just to echo Mark's sentiments, thank you to everyone for joining us today. My name is Taylor Stein. I'm a U.S. Marketing and Partnerships Manager here at Elsevier, and it is my great pleasure to introduce our two speakers today. So our first speaker, James Toon, is a customer consultant for Elsevier, specializing in the use of its current research information system here. James's role is to work with customers to support and consult on best practice approaches for peers' use within their institution. James has actually been working with PURE for many years, having previously been the research information manager at a large research-intensive university within the UK. We are also very delighted to have Marielle Christian with us today. Marielle is the senior manager and corporate librarian at RTI International. The library serves researchers in 10 U.S. and 10 international locations. Marielle is responsible for identifying and meeting the varied information of the institute. She coordinates research, reports, and analyzes metrics that show the impact of RTI's research worldwide with the goal of improving the human condition by turning knowledge into practice. Marielle also manages a large portfolio of research tools and resources and is an active member of both of SLA and the North Carolina chapter of SLA. So again, thank you to James and both for joining us today to speak on the presentation. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to hand it over to our first presenter, James Toon. Okay, well, thanks very much, Taylor, um, and thanks very much, Mark, as well, for the introductions. Uh, so I'm going to uh, start off our presentation to talk about librarians and stakeholders in managing the research enterprise. So what I'm going to basically cover today, um, three core areas, um, essentially what is a research information system, just a sort of a quick, uh, quick primer on that so people know uh, the nature of the systems we're looking at, a little look then at how um, libraries and uh, interact with the research information systems and how the, 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 the service category is developing for them, and then finally, uh, before I hand over to Marielle, uh, I'll just run through some uh, practical observations that we've, um, we've made over the years, uh, lessons learned that I have uh, personally come across um, whilst uh, using a system like Pure, which is the, the Elsevier Chris system um, in uh, uh, institutions. Okay. So just really to start off, um, just a basic characterization of uh, what we're talking about when we mean research information systems. Um, these are also known interchangeably as CRIS systems, uh, sometimes known as, as RIS systems uh, or uh, research information management systems as well. So I all tend to use the, the RIS um, uh, 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 version of that, um, but uh, you'll have your own, your own choice. Uh, essentially what they are uh, is uh, a system of record of research information for universities as a whole. Uh, and when I'm describing it, I like to kind of characterize it more as, as like if we're trying to produce an academic CV but representing the entire institution. Um, 
the system will always do. Uh, it also provides with an excellent platform for integrating information from many different sources across the institution. Um, and interestingly for our system, uh, it also allows two different directions, if you like, of management. Um, so we provide functionality and support both for uh, administrators uh, to help them make use of information that's stored within the system, but we also provide sort of more bottom-up type requirements where we're actually uh, assisting researchers in, in, in their day-to-day -day activities as well. So uh, it can be sometimes provide us with some interesting kind of conflicts of, uh, of operation uh, uh, around some of the functions like, for example, reporting. And the system as well, it gives us a great way of being able to kind of provide a vehicle for discovery and access of content that the institution wishes to make public. Um, and that can be used then for people uh, from the press, for example, uh, any academic collaborators looking to work with people, and also potentially for uh, prospective students, prospective staff who may be uh, looking at an institution's capability. So what are some of the key drivers then that have seen uh, research information systems emerge over the last few years? Uh, so um, without question, the last, say, five to ten years, we've seen an absolute explosion in the need for uh, systems, uh, systems like this, basically driven around some of the increased competition for funding, um, the need to basically find a competitive edge. Uh, you know, so uh, making the best out of the information you have within the institution is critical. Uh, we've seen a growth in research assessment, um, particularly over, over here in, in, in Europe, um, uh, around the UK especially, with uh, exercises like the REF. Um, but also increasingly so as well across other territories now, we're seeing more research assessment work appearing in places like Australia, uh, and also places like the Netherlands and Denmark and Finland and other areas. Uh, we also see a greater need as well to manage funded compliance reporting, uh, particularly around areas like open access, uh, but also more generically um, around um, demonstrating return on investment for funded activity that uh, institutions are asking to do. We also see increased requirement for support around some of the uh, major accreditations, examples like the, uh, the AACSB for business schools or the uh, AVMA for, for veterinary schools. Scholarly communications, um, obviously increasingly important, the marketing of the institution's outputs, the marketing of the institution's staff uh, to get better contacts, better citations, etc. And that doesn't just um, uh, uh, focus on things like publications, but increasingly as well, we're seeing um, a greater need to promote uh, other alternative content types like uh, research data sets, for example, uh, but also other knowledge exchange um, um, activities as well, uh, all with a view to try and improve uh, institutional impact. Interestingly as well, um, this is a chance for us to bring together um, a, a, an institutional view on research activity. And it's amazing, talking to institutions across the world, how few of them actually really know what research activity is being undertaken at their institutions in any given year. We might be able to look at aggregation databases and see perhaps 75 to 80% of our published outcomes, but there are many, many, many other outputs that are being produced um, on a day-to-day -day basis that actually never really make it into, uh, into a lot of uh, systems. So the, uh, the risk system it gives a very, very kind of good uh, means to be able to bring together an entire institutional uh, uh, picture. And with all of this as well, um, there is a massive need now to coordinate and to manage the administrative burden that we now place on our academic staff. Uh, so the increased need for all these kind of assessment compliance uh, requirements and things that you know, they all have very, very specific and very, very definite needs uh, that need to be managed. So what sort of scope um, do these systems cover? Um, so generally speaking, they, they're very, very broad across the research uh, life cycle, um, uh, servicing most, most needs. Uh, so that starts right at the beginning when talking about things like pre-award systems. Um, so for the uh, ability, uh, for example, to find uh, new funding opportunities, to be able to make applications, to be able to uh, manage that process through, uh, to send it to funders, receiving uh, award notifications. Once the research is underway, um, the ability for us to be able to then capture that research activity, so the, uh, the, the outputs, the publications, patterns, etc. The ability for us to be able to capture professional activities and other accolades. Um, attendance at conferences, uh, keynotes, any peer review activity that may be undertaken, any prizes received, rewards. Uh, we're also starting to capture an awful lot more in the way of, of media activity, so uh, it's an increasingly important area where we're trying to look at things like reach and significance of our, of our research. Um, so. Um, press stories, uh, uh, contributions people will make, interviews they're, uh, they're, they're giving to the press, and radio, to television. Uh, and the attention they receive as a consequence, uh, attention they may receive also through Twitter or through Facebook or you know, uh, other, other uh, academic news sites. 
Also providing uh, some scope coverage for students, so the ability for us to be able to manage uh, students as people within the institutions, uh, postgraduate students uh, in particular, workflows around things like thesis management and deposits, all the very, very complex um, uh, workflows that sit around research assessment and compliance work, and also management information, so uh, the, the increased needs of all of our, of our, our research kind of managers to, to bring information out and to, and to bring it together and provide it available as dashboards uh, for decision making and research strategy in, in general. So the integration is important, so uh, systems like Pure, they essentially are placed like a piece of middleware within an institution. Um, so they, they, will, they will sit and then they'll bring data in from a number of other corporate sources, uh, very typically HR systems when talking about stuff, uh, people uh, leaving, people joining, that sort of thing. Uh, finance systems and pre-award management systems, so information about uh, applications made, any, uh, transactional data. The student systems, uh, IP systems, press, off information, press office systems, and also bringing information in from any other external sources, um, connected sources like, for example, Scopus or PubMed. Within the system itself, uh, this is where we deal all the, the, kind of the, the, the interaction. So we have our, our researchers and our research administrators dealing with uh, all the workflows that are associated with this data, bringing it together and combining it. And then that data is then made available through um, services, uh, so research portals, websites, uh, uh, discovery services internally potentially as well, uh, open access systems, um, uh, making available publications uh, for, for access there. Uh, providing data out to content management systems, uh, uh, emphasizing the sort of, you know, end, end to once reuse as many times as you can type approach. Uh, normally they would be driven through web services, and those web services could also feed into uh, institutional uh, research assessment activities, uh, accreditation support, and the production of, of academic CVs. So very, very comprehensive overall. And because of the comprehensive nature of the systems, there tends to be a very, very broad range of stakeholders uh, involved in the process. So that would include library staff, that would include research office staff, um, but also uh, teams like international offices, um, uh, recruitment teams, uh, industrial teams, uh, many, many more. And of course, all these individuals have very, very context-specific roles that they need to play, um, both uh, from an administrative perspective, but also at the, the faculty, the school, the divisional um, level as well. Each of these kind of elements within the institution has their own particular requirements and needs. So of course, what is the librarian's role in this space? Uh, so librarians clearly need to partner very much with all these stakeholders to establish that role as institutional specialists, uh, informational specialists within, the, uh, within research information management. Making use of uh, existing specialisms, uh, very much built around the uh, content acquisition, content management, uh, making sure that content is available, uh, well-structured and discovered. Um, and I put in there serendipitous as well, because serendipitous discovery is one of the really, really important things that we now see from these information systems, because we can obviously find information that's related to known um, uh, affiliations and known collaborators, but it's, it's much, much harder to find, for example, people who are actual natural contacts when trying to build collaboration networks. But through content that's mined through systems like, uh, like Pure, it's much easier to be able to find, for example, people who perhaps um, supervise students who have become lecturers at other institutions, people who may have worked in industry, who may have more direct contacts, um, uh, people who are presenting in seminar series overseas. You know, these are all very, very rich contacts that you can then, uh, then use internally. Content curation. Uh, content curation, obviously, uh, talking about the outputs of research. But we also have a much greater need as well now to be able to deal with content curation for uh, content like uh, journal data, for example, or publisher information, uh, information about equipment and facilities within institutions, um, making sure we're managing the, uh, the inf academic information about staff that we may actually manage within the system. So a much broader range of things there. Uh, clearly, there's a major role in terms of providing advice, uh, reopen access, copyright issues for academic staff, uh, and that can be managed as well through the systems, very, very important. Uh, advocacy, so engagement, uh, training, um, uh, making sure that the researchers feel involved in the process, making sure that the administrators are getting what they need out of the systems. The assessment of scholarly impact, uh, bibliometrics being a key one, obviously, but also starting to look more at the sort of more alternative metrics approaches um, as well, to try and understand a little bit more about the impact outside of academia, uh, increasingly important kind of elements within there. Uh, a lot of joining the dots, so um, whilst content can come, come into the system, uh, it doesn't always get linked together automatically, so we wouldn't necessarily know 
where a particular piece of uh, research was funded, for example, from a particular research fund or, or other institutional fund. So there's an important um, goal there of being able to kind of join together that piece of information. So we can start to look at, for example, where a product has funded a, a research output which has resulted in somebody being invited to present at the keynote at a conference and consequential impact they may have drawn out of that. And also the need for the librarians to be able to help facilitate reuse as much as they can based on this aggregation of data uh, across the institution. Uh, so helping, for example, provide information that can then be deep linked into press releases uh, and other scholarly communications means. And of course the system provides um, uh, uh, lots of support um, for librarians in this space. So, for example, uh, automated, uh, automated content discovery, the ability to look up in, uh, in sources like Scopus, PubMed, uh, WorldCat, etc., uh, try to find content that can be input in, into systems easily. Uh, we provide services that can help around author disambiguation. Um, uh, increasingly important to try and you know, bring together information uh, accurately as possible. Um, open access workflow and support, uh, so uh, clearly needs around that. Uh, lots of services to facilitate things like deduplication, uh, help authors disclaim content that they perhaps um, have been incorrectly associated with. All these associated workflows that come with merit assessment mechanisms, um, uh, faculty reporting, for example, and automated content curation wherever possible. So, for example, automatic drawdown of metrics data, uh, automatic uh, identification of data improvement opportunities for, uh, for example, looking for uh, missing addresses and external organization data and, and these sorts of things. We also provide uh, lots and lots of services to help um, provide information that can be then fed out. So uh, reporting services, um, uh, graphical reporting services, dashboarding services, um, uh, metrics reporting, and also increasingly the ability to provide robust uh, web services that allow people to be able to make use of the data um, for their own purposes as much as possible. We also provide uh, a number of uh, services to help uh, with research profiling. Uh, showcasing of research, so things like uh, Pure Portal, for example, uh, bringing together information and presenting it as, uh, as, as and making it available as widely as possible. Uh, we also provide a lot of support with built-in repository connectors, so uh, institutions that may have uh, existing uh, space Fedora ePrints repository software in place, they can still keep these um, these pieces of software into in the workflows uh, as a connected system as well. So. Some of the considerations that we need to think about. Um, so being part of the institutional workflow, uh, increasingly important these days to be able to kind of work outside the boundaries of the library. Um, so uh, this will be done uh, a lot anyway, but um, increasingly now, based on the kind of broad range of stakeholders that we have, um, that the need, for example, for library staff to be working much more directly with people like international offices or uh, working with finance teams in the research office, um, stepping into some of the territories that perhaps they may not have been involved with in the past. Because again, of this kind of broad uh, institutional kind of entity model uh, we produce with a research information system, understanding and maintaining that institutional data model and all of its dependencies is absolutely critical. So knowing, for example, when uh, a related entity like a, an organizational hierarchy changes, for example, what the impact of that is down the line in a number of different connected systems, and able to kind of facilitate work around that sort of area. Building partnerships with other institutional stakeholders. Um, so. Uh, it's one thing knowing that you have a stakeholder in the finance office, but the ability to perhaps influence um, that stakeholder in some way if they need to change their practice uh, is an increasingly the kind of uh, important skill. Understanding that data governance, uh, uh, who is responsible for managing and maintaining the data, who has ultimate ownership of things like, for example, organizational hierarchies within a system. Uh, if these are all connected, how is that all managed? And as a result of that, the need to be able to manage uh, policy and manage operational governance across this shared data model. So participating much more widely uh, in that institutional data set. Also uh, increasingly important to learn about a very diverse set of use cases uh, within the system. So um, uh, needing, for example, to learn an awful lot more about the actual pre-award application processes that go on, uh, approval stages, um, uh, ethical checking, these sorts of things when awards are actually sort of made, um, what are the requirements actually at the point of award that the funder may, may, may place on the investigator, what sort of post-award reporting requirements are needed. Uh, we, may need, we may know funder policies, but there may be other elements within there that we need to deal with, like uh, impact management or associated with research data or research facilities. Understanding knowledge exchange and impact management. Uh, this has been a very, very fascinating area in the last few years, uh, again, particularly over here in the UK. Uh, so it's one thing understanding 
the need uh, to be able to kind of report on things like um, the attendance at conferences and uh, uh, some of the other sort of uh, uh, research activities like summer schools and, and uh, exhibitions and performance, that sort of thing. But knowing how to then evidence the activities um, that have been undertaken and actually turn that into, into impact and understand the impact, understand the change that the research is then having in the wider space. Uh, it's a very, very kind of difficult area that actually not a lot of researchers understand themselves either. So um, this, is a, this has been a very big growth uh, area and I think very important. And also learning about alternative metrics. Um, so what does it mean if you get lots of tweets? What does it mean if you're uh, on a wiki page? You know, what are the indicators that can be drawn from them, again, to provide evidence that might support a wider impact outside of academia? You need to learn about broader institutional drivers. So what's important? So why does the international office need to know about your information? Why does your events management team, why, do they, why, why would they be interested in, in who's current expert in the subject areas within your institutions? There are many use cases, again, that kind of help uh, drive some of the need from uh, the research databases. There are some very interesting issues around professional jurisdiction uh, in this institutional model. So uh, for example, the library may wish to uh, influence for example, the quality of metadata that's being placed on, uh, on, pro on project or application records. You know, the finance teams may not be that interested in the project titles, but actually when they come through into the system, they, they may then be used to present information externally. Uh, this has a great influence. So uh, who has the ability to be able to influence that? Um, you know, so if, if uh, stakeholders in the library then go to, for example, the finance teams and say, you need to change the, your practice for recording from the project references, for example, on grants, uh, do they have that ability? Uh, and if not, how do they do that? The rapid change in this space as well, uh, so the new policies, new, new requirements around research uh, data, open access coming out all the time. Uh, how quickly can we deal with those? How quickly can we deal with training, uh, uh, keeping the materials up to date, uh, uh, understanding what actually needs to be implemented? And the need to develop more technical skills. So uh, a lot of requirements around uh, things like XML, uh, dealing with APIs and web services, you know, REST, SOAP interfaces, and so forth. Again, a lot of these skills may already exist within the library space, but uh, in a number of cases, they do not. And actually, the need to make use of them to be able to make uh, better use of your system uh, increasingly important. And some genuine practical challenges. There is an enormous volume of information being drawn into these systems. So a, a, a large institution may be producing six, 7,000 publications a year. Of those, there may be you know, an equivalent sort of 15 to 20,000 external organizations um, linked, external persons linked. Uh, we have to be able to deal with making sure this information is high quality. Having a great quality data model is of no use if the data quality in the model uh, is poor. Um, but the sheer volume is, is a massive administrative burden that we need to then deal with. And it cannot be assumed either. So you cannot assume, for example, that linked data that comes in from an HR system is going to be wholly accurate. You cannot assume that data comes in from a finance system is going to be wholly accurate. We also need to have to deal with uh, uh, interoperability both internally and also externally. So um, how we can deal with things like common data models that can be used across the sector, uh, the, uh, in, increasingly big challenges, the, the need for managing standardization uh, in the research information space. And it's not helped a lot by the fact there's very limited taxonomy in some of the uh, research information areas, like, for example, activity and impact data. Uh, so of course, this is being looked at, and there are a number of organizations like CASRI who, uh, who are trying to come up with these sorts of um, uh, control vocabularies. And there are data models that are managed by people like uh, Eurochris, for example, the Serif um, data models to try and kind of build structure around this area. But you know, it still remains a massive challenge for us. And lastly, I think and this is a really important slide um, for me, um, staff training, staff development. So there is a very, very diverse set of approaches to how you deal with research information management across institutions and also within institutions. It tends to be very, very different, um, not just regionally, uh, internationally, uh, but also within institutions. Um, you may have 20, 30 different schools, and you may have you know, 100 different departments. Each of those may have their own administrative support who may have their own way of approaching capturing information around research information. So you need to try and avoid creating hundreds and hundreds of different ways to perform the same sorts of tasks. Uh, this is a massive challenge. Uh, you tend to have one system uh, to be able to deal with these things. Uh, you need to be able to manage common uh, taxonomy, common vocabularies around uh, some of the approaches are uh, very, very important too. Another area we've seen happen a lot is this rise of the accidental information manager. Uh, and the accidental information manager uh, is, is somebody I, I call a passing PhD student or an administrator who perhaps was just 
uh, in the wrong place at the wrong time. So uh, you know, your, your, your kind of investigator, who's obviously very, very busy dealing with research activity and research work, doesn't want to have to be burdened with massive amounts of research admin. So they tend to grab the nearest person that can help them, in this case here. So we've seen a huge squadron of individuals across institutions becoming uh, information managers and becoming responsible, ultimately, for um, dealing with some of these areas of compliance. Uh, and that can be a huge issue, of course, internally with their uh, keeping control of that. Uh, how do you keep them trained? How do you keep these individuals up to date with uh, new uh, uh, policy changes, new uh, information about kind of best practice in the areas? And as well, because it's such a new area, um, the sort of broad institutional research management, there tends to be limited uh, professional development opportunities for existing staff, uh, professional within the library, but also uh, uh, across the whole uh, of the stakeholders in the institution. So I think it would be great to be able to see a, a much, much more proactive approach in terms of developing uh, these sorts of mechanisms within there. OK. So. That was at my uh, my set of slides. I hope that was okay, and I hope I didn't talk far too quickly. Um, but uh, there'll be questions at the end. Uh, but for now, I'd like to hand over, if I may, to to Marielle Christian from RTI, who will uh, talk to us a little about their reason for choosing Pure and what they've been doing with it over the uh, last few years. Thank you, James. My, as James said, my name is Marielle Christian, and I am the senior manager and corporate librarian at RTI International. And I would like to um, talk to you about a couple of things this afternoon. I'm going to tell you a little bit about RTI, how we came about choosing PURE, and our rollout procedures, and the current uses and future projects for PURE. RTI International um, was founded in 1958. So we will be celebrating our 60th anniversary next year. We've grown into one of the world's leading research institutes by, maintain, by remaining focused on our mission to improve the human condition by turning knowledge into practice. Here is RTI at a glance. We have a very diverse global workforce. We have um, staff in 10 international locations, in domestic locations, we speak over 90 languages, 105 nationalities. We are truly an international organization. The library at RTI is our, our the name of our center is Library and Information Services. So if you see LIS, that's what it stands for. We've internally branded PURE as CRIS, and that stands for the Comprehensive Research Information System. So you'll see, I, I may use the term in, interchangeably, but internally we call PURE CRIS. Our timeline for purchasing CRIS, I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about that. The library's always had the responsibility for our publications database. Um, that was the our in-house database that housed peer-reviewed journal articles, books, book chapters, patents, conference proceedings, and conference proceedings. That information was vetted, researched, and verified. It was also displayed on our external website, so it needed to be correct. In um, 2015, we were given the responsibility for another internal database that was called the Scientific Stature Database. Uh, the acronym for that is SSD. That database was used for, it had an internal use only. It was self-reported and the information was not verified for accuracy. <clears throat> it captured scientific stature achievements. It supported performance appraisals, and documented citations for author awards, uh, an internal award that we give to our researchers. It also was used as a vehicle for keeping resumes updated. It was not actively managed, not consistently updated, and it was manual entry. So that database had a lot of problems. Many hands in the pot made the data dirty. So when we were 
given the responsibility for that database, we had to find a system that could meet both of the needs of the data that needed to be viewable on our external website and also the data that was used internally. We had been a part of a consortium called ReachNC, and they used Pure at the time, but they only used the portal. So that was all I had ever seen. Once the consortia uh, disbanded, I was contacted by Elsevier and asked if we wanted to continue using Pure. That's when I realized how powerful it was. I had never seen the back end of Pure, so I didn't know what it consisted of and how really that was the answer to, to our problem. We were going to create another in-house database that combined these two, but that really would not have solved our problem. So we had a demo of Pure and we, uh, we purchased it. We combined the data in October 2016. That was when we launched um, Chris internally. Oh, I'll say one more thing. At the slogan that we have here at RTI is the library is the single source to my, to my previous slide. The library is the single source of truth for scientific stature at RTI. And that has served us well. As I said, Chris was launched in October 2016. At launch, we had 1,390 research, researcher profiles. We currently have 1,884 current profiles and 2,474 former, pro, former profiles. So we have increased quite a number in, in just the last seven months. We've really we have a much better idea of how to use it, how to change them from current to former and add profiles as we need it. We, to we currently now have a total of over 4,000 profiles. Uh, research output, we, we launched with um, just over 26,000 pieces of uh, research output. We currently have almost 50,000. And we, in addition to that, we have over 6,000 um, activity records. We have prizes and media as well. The vision that we have for Chris in uh, FY17 in our fiscal year is October 1st to September 30th. We are, we, we just finished launching activities we're looking forward to Chris, uh, excuse me, Pure's release of their new reporting module because we definitely need greater rep enhanced reporting. We're getting time cited counts in the records. We've connected Pure with our Web of Science subscription so that we can join, uh, integrate that information, journal impact factors as well. Um, as I said earlier, we use Chris for Author Awards. That's an internal awards program that we have. It's made that much easier to determine who is eligible for certain awards. We're currently exploring the possibility of using Chris for electronic resumes, for dynamically generated resumes. We have an internal database here at RTI of resumes, but it's static. And every time a resume is changed and updated, it needs to be uploaded to that database. We're, we're looking at the possibility of using CRIS for that purpose. There is a CV module in CRIS, and we're trying to determine what data we would need to import into CRIS to be able to use it for our purposes and how customizable um, it is so that we could could use it for that purpose. 
I have to report back to our executive leadership in September on our recommendations and what we believe it would take to actually launch that program here at RTI using CRIS for dynamically generated resumes. Plumex, uh, our LIS had a subscription to Plumex prior to us purchasing uh, Pure. And, but of course the two systems were not related or integrated and since Elsevier has acquired Plumex and is getting ready to integrate those two systems, I think that that's going to be a huge improvement for us. Uh, my president asked me a couple of years ago to find a system that would report on the alternative metrics and that's when I purchased Plumex, but we really had no way of reporting that data out and it was difficult to get to. It didn't, the reports didn't come in a way that was easy for me to present. And so I'm really, really hoping that um, with the integration of these two products, we'll finally get what we need as far as um, reporting on alternative metrics. Um, the next thing I'd like to show you is an internal report that um, Library and Information Services produces. This is the second year, this is our second report that I've done. I did it in FY15 as well. And that, this report was so well received by our executive leadership, our board of directors and board of governors that they now can't wait for me to produce it. Um, they're asking me for it before the end of the fiscal year. so. <laughs> I can't give it to them until it's ended and I can calculate all the numbers, but these are some of the measures and metrics that we're that the library is responsible for. And as I said, they really rely and count on us providing this information. They use this information for, um, inter for institute goals. We have uh, what's called a volume metric that uh, is measured and that's where they calculate peer-reviewed publications, how many we had for the year, uh, a breadth metric, and that's based on productivity, where peer-reviewed journal articles, uh, non-peer-reviewed publications, conference proceedings, conference presentations, and patents are divided by the number of technical staff that we have here, and bonuses are given out based on this information. So the information that we provide here in the library is an integral part of what goes on at RTI. They, they really rely on us to provide this information for them. Here is a um, pure profile. One, there are a couple of things that RTI does differently from most of the uh, customers that have Pure. One is we don't have the PRS um, service. We, we import our data ourselves from Web of Science and PubMed and our researchers um, add data themselves as well, but we do not use the PRS system. We don't have a subscription to Scopus and our portal is not open to the public. <clears throat> the reason for the portal not being open to the public is that we have an external website and we feed data from Chris to that website, to, to the website, only certain categories of data. Because as I said earlier, um, some of the, many of the categories of data are not vetted and they're, we can't guarantee that it's accurate, so we're not going to display it on the external website. I am going to show you, you can see how um, wide, how wide of a reach um, Pure has as far as the different categories of data that it captures. And I'll show you a, the same profile on our external website. This is what's called our expert profile on our website and um, as you can see it's not as robust 
as what you get from the pure po profile. But again, as I said, um, because the data, many categories of the data are used for internal purposes only, and we don't have enough personnel um, or time to vet and verify all the categories of data, we've chosen the ones that are um, most important and need to be represented externally, and we make sure that data is um, clean. And those are the things that we feed to our external website. And that is my presentation. Um, I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit more about RTI and how we've used PURE. And please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Marielle. Um, and also, thank you, James, um, so much for your presentations today. Uh, Mark, are we good to go into the Q&A? Definitely. It looks like we have a few questions in the uh, Q&A uh, pod there. And I would encourage folks, uh, if you have additional questions, please dro drop those into the Q&A. Um, and I'm sure our speakers will be happy to answer them if they are able. Okay, great. So let's start uh, taking some of the questions. Um, so we have one question that uh, I think perhaps could be for, for both speakers, uh, which is, how are the researcher profiles populated? Uh, so James, perhaps you can speak to that uh, generally, and then Marielle, if, if you've done anything differently at RTI, you can um, give a little more detail. Yes. Sure, okay. So, so um, how, how are research profiles populated? Um, so there are a number of different ways of doing this, and um, there obviously there are a number of different forms of this as well. So uh, researcher profiles, um, they tend to relate to the individual, so that can be more to do with uh, things like biographical information or uh, key, uh, key research interests, that sort of thing. Um, so a lot, a lot of times that data will tend to come from uh, within existing HR systems internally, uh, and, and populate, but then once that data comes across into Pure, um, it can then be made available for uh, obviously the users themselves to log on, and then they can, they can start to add information as well that um, will support their profile information, like for example whether or not they're prepared to take PhD students, uh, their past uh, uh, employment history, that sort of thing. Um, um, and then for things like uh, the, the publication data, so publication data can be added in a number of different ways as well. Um, it can be manually added, uh, so there's obviously the, a fairly sort of standard sort of template-based approach to that. Uh, it's often the choice of last resort, to be honest. Uh, more typically, what people will do is they will either import data in by connecting to an external source like, for example, Scopus, uh, Web of Science, PubMed, etc. Um, in which case, the system will look up in those sources and find import candidates, and then people will bring that data in, and they can they can automate that process as much as possible. Uh, they can upload data from uh, reference managers, um, like for example in Note. Um, you see, you can bring in uh, RIS file formats, uh, Bibtec file formats, and you can also uh, upload data via uh, publications XML, which is a, a, a sort of proprietary schema, if you like, that's been generated to, uh, for content types in the system, and data can be added that way around as well. And the same applies for the upload uh, for uh, all the other content types, activities data, data sets data, etc. Uh, the only difference really is that in a number of cases, like, uh, for example, activities, there is no such thing as an equivalent of Scopus or Web of Science. There's no equivalent of an aggregation database for that sort of information. So it tends to have to be done manually uh, from that point of view. And actually, for that sort of data, you do also need to have the intellectual contribution often from the academic staff member to make that as accurate as it can be. So many different ways of getting information into, into the profiles, um, but they tend to be uh, mostly manually curated. Uh, the PRS service that Mario talked about a little, um, that's uh, the profile refinement service that Elsevier offers. Uh, and in that case, um, uh, we will uh, uh, help you automate the process of, of acquiring data that exists in Scopus, for example, and feed that in automatically on a regular basis, either as a one-off task or on a subscription basis. Um, so yeah, a number of different ways of doing it. At, at RCI, um, we, the way that we imported the, the data from the two existing databases was XML. We had in-house experts to help write scripts that um, got the, you know, imported the data from each of those databases. 
that was a very long and arduous process. Um, uh, some of the other categories that, that the current, the more current data is coming in from Web of Science and PubMed, and the researchers themselves are populating their profiles. We also have a data warehouse here at RTI where many, most of our internal systems, the data from those individual systems is kept in a, da a data warehouse, and we are able to get um, data from there. So the what do I do, um, collaboration interests and skills and areas of expertise, that information comes from our data warehouse and populates um, the profiles. Great. Thank you both. Um, we've had a few other questions come in. Um, so the next question is, does the CV model also support output as NIH or federal biosketches? So yes, yeah, so I'll answer that one. Um, so we do actually, we have a CV module, um, does provide an NIH uh, biosketch CV template. Um, so the CV module itself um, is designed to be modular. Um, so uh, increasingly we're starting to add in there a number of different um, uh, export formats if you like for uh, for funder uh, biosketch um, type requirements. So yes, we do NIH biosketches. Um, yes, we, we looked at the NIH biosketch um, template and actually found that it didn't really meet our needs. We gave some feedback to Elsevier and um, and let me just make a point here. Because we're a different kind of organization, we're a research organization and not a university, the way that we use PURE, I think, well, is very different and I think was new to um, Elsevier, but they have been extremely responsive to our um, suggestions and requests. And so we've seen a lot of the things that we've asked for are things that we suggested that they may not have even thought about because no one has used it in that way previously. Um, they've been very responsive to um, our suggestions and our uh, particular needs. And so uh, along those lines, we let them know that the way that the CV module um, displays the NIH biosketch um, format really, it, it doesn't really match up to what the NIH requires. And so I'm hoping that um, we'll see some change there also in the future. Great. And uh, now, Mario, uh, we have a question directed at you, uh, which is that um, uh, during your presentation, you mentioned that you used her to determine eligibility. Uh, and so just wondering if you could give a little more detail on how exactly you do that. I'm sorry, I, I use PURE to determine eligibility? Uh, yes, that's the question. I think it was, um, I don't know if the, the, the individual who asked the question could add a little more detail, but I think it might have been res with respect to um, not promotion, but perhaps awards. Oh, the author awards. Um, yes, that's a, those are internal awards that there are seven awards, I believe, and they all have different criteria. So some of them are, uh, one of them is highly published and uh, one award is uh, early career author. Let me see if I can find those. So we use um, Pure. We have a search strategy set up in Pure that helps us identify those. So it goes through the publications in a certain year or a certain time frame, and in and, and that way, the way that we structure the search, it can identify authors who are eligible, who appear to be eligible for those awards um, in that year. We, we give the awards out annually, so we're looking at a period of time. Great. Thank you, Mario. Um, and I, I hope I interpreted that, that question correctly. Um, so I just wanted to check uh, if you do have any further um, questions. Could you uh, now would be a great time to type them into the Q&A box? Uh, 
Okay. And well, Mark, um, if I can hand it back over to you. Great. Well, uh, thank you very much, Taylor. And thank you, James and uh, Marielle. This is Mark, as Taylor said, from ACRLN Choice. Um, thanks to each of our presenters today for spending some time with us and, and sharing a bit of a information on Pure and how you use it at RTI and, and um, all of the, the various features that you've covered. Uh, I would also offer a quick reminder to everyone on the line with us. Uh, we did record today's program, so please be on the lookout for a follow-up email from ACRL and Choice with a link to the recording. Um, and I would also mention that uh, we have the feedback survey, which you can find in the chat box if you have a few minutes after the presentation today to uh, let us know how we did. We would appreciate that. So thanks again to everyone out there for joining us today. I hope you have enjoyed the session. And I hope you have a great afternoon. Thanks so much.